Hello, football family, and I'm here with Jason from Huddle Up Films. We're going to talk about his big board, baby. I'm so excited. He says he's locked in. He told me he's twiddling his thumbs. He's waiting for Thursday. Jason, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. Sounded good there. Nice intro. I hope my big board's done. I, I really don't want to mess with it anymore. We've come to the time, Alec, where all these rumors get in, filtered in about injuries, and this guy's right, and I just try not to listen to any of it because – Half of it is smoke screens, maybe more than half. I'm going to stick to my evaluation, but I appreciate you having me on for this exercise. I think it's a good one. Yeah, I'm not so sure if you're actually done toiling with that big board. I feel like every day you're giving me a ring saying, I did this, I did that. I had to go in here and double check the numbers before we did this show. But the point of this is to talk about the risers and the fallers. You know, back at the beginning of the process, you release a big, of course, over time, we get more information and things change. So we have some of the biggest risers and fallers. We're going to kind of just go down the big board, kind of talk about the biggest prospects first. So Quinion Mitchell, he went up four spots from 14 to 10. Explain yourself, mister. So, uh, you know, four spots doesn't seem like a lot, but going from 14 to 10 is, is a good jump. And the reason is, you know, I kept wanting to temper my expectations with him coming from Toledo, which, as you know, isn't the biggest school. But – you have to trust what you see. And that's where I fell on with Quinion Mitchell, explosive uh, eyes for the ball. I think he could be asked to press, even though he played a lot of off coverage in the games that I saw. And then going back and watching the senior bowl, him and Max Melton, clearly the two best corners there. So when he was matched up in drills that favor the wide receiver, the wide receiver can go anywhere he wants. There's no down the distance. There's no clues. You're facing the guy for the first time. You're coming cold off there. And then in the mix, he was clearly a supreme athlete. So a lot of players, you know, that come from smaller schools, a lot of times they're dropped down the list because you question their competition. But adding the tape to his offseason, how he looked at the senior bowl, running how he ran at the combine, I just, I just, have, I just love him. I think that he has the potential to be a lockdown corner. For sure. He was loyal to Toledo, like you mentioned. He could have went elsewhere, but he stayed there. 4.33 in the 40. Diagnosed as well, like you said. Uh, teammates speak very well of him. No uh, penalties or missed tackles. And, um, you know, you can kind of get over his lack of prototypical size um, and lack of slot work. I mean, this guy feels like an outside corner that could be, you know, a foundational piece, like you said, for your franchise. Yeah, so I, I jumped them ahead of guys like Jared Verse and Leatu Latu uh, and Brian Thomas. I just I just couldn't hold him down anymore. I had to give him his proper due. And part of it with the uh, edge rushers is the Ravens has saw, signed Kyle Van Noy since then. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe if we talk about edge rushers later on moving down the list uh, and up the list, that has to do with the signing of Van Noy and the style of edge rusher and the need for it. Well, that's the next guy. So if we talk about Darius Robinson out of Missouri, he went from number 18 to 30, down 12 spots. It's a pretty substantial drop. Is it just mostly because of the signing of Van Noy? That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. I had him and Chop Robinson, and still do, frankly, a very even type grade. Uh, the one thing I would say about Darius Robinson is I'm a little bit weary. One of the reasons I ended up dropping him down is that he was an inside player for a few years production wasn't there. They moved him to the outside. His production took off. So he's got a little bit of one year wonder to his profile. And that kind of scared me off a little bit. So I still think that he could go first round. I still think that he could go in the top 20, but for this exercise and with Kyle Van Noy and the other needs, I decided to drop Darius Robinson down a sum. And he, you know, he fell below some of the more premium positions and the positions that are uh, immediate needs for the Ravens. Yeah, I think this was a really smart move personally. I am weary of his profile in general um, at that rich of a cost. Um, just don't see the refined player you would hope to get at that point. Seems like a project. I mean, he's got the exact you know length and strength that you would hope for and frame, but um, kind of the lack of his second move and uh, his edge setting at this point makes me weary. Um, so I, I personally think he should be right in that sweet spot of where we'll never get him. Right, because um, he'll somebody will take him before we go, or we'll go for a more premium position, and then uh, like or like a tackle or something, and then 
by the next pick, forget about it, right? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Stuck in that between our first pick and second pick, guaranteed to go. Some other guys like Keon Coleman and some of the receivers, uh, Ricky Pearsall, I think are in that category where they're they're not going to be probably the best pick for us at 30, but um, we'll go before 62. For sure. Now this guy, he fell a ton, and I think I know why. I'm talking about uh, Kamari Lassiter out of Georgia, cornerback. That slow 40, man, it makes it tough. It really does, and it's a shame because, you know, I, I evaluate these guys, and one of the questions I had before they run, before the combine, and I said, you know, the only question I had about his game was his speed, and he didn't run at the combine. So I'm like, you know what, it's probably best that he didn't run. He probably saved himself some money because if he would have ran a 4-6, it would have really hurt his draft spot stock because his tape is good. His tape is very good, very pro feel to Kamari Lassiter's game, uh, just a route anticipation. He's got a lot of, like Kool-Aid McKinstry, I'd say, is the only one more polished as a cornerback than him but then he decided to run in his pro day Al alec and <laughs> the hand times were between four six one and four six five at a pro day and usually traditionally your pro day numbers are going to be better than your combine numbers you're at home uh all kinds of stuff that they do there the times are hand times not electronic so if you're a corner and you're running four six one i just could not justify having them all the way up where i had them at 37 so i dropped them out of that second round grade and by not giving him a second round grade, it dropped him further than it would uh, if I just dropped him down a couple of tiers in the same overall grading. So from 37 down to wherever he is now, what is it, 61, 61. Alec? Yeah, 61. I feel like that's about right. And uh, if a team maybe wants to move him to safety or if they're a team that doesn't see themselves or putting him in a position in man coverage, maybe they like him as an off corner. And I think that that would help. And maybe he does go early. But for me, speed is kind of uh, non-negotiable for cornerbacks. That's the one position that I really like speed and quickness. And four six one just wasn't sitting right with me, having him that high up on the board. I agree. I mean, that three cone was incredible. We know how important that can be. It plays into his instinctive nature and how he's kind of a student of the game. Um, you know, savvy against the run. But I don't know, man. He would have to – be really protected by the scheme i think you know maybe only at nickel um you know always in zone kind of thing but yeah I, I i share a lot of the same concerns you know if i see him having to run down the field trying to be like a seam splitter uh it could be really bad for that defense next up sticking with the corners is max melton also a senior bowl standout out of Rutgers. what do you have to say about him Hey, James Ogden's one of his favorites. I believe he put the red star on Max Melton. One of my favorites, and the more I watched, the more I liked. It's pretty much that simple. He did, of course, skip ahead of Lassiter in the process, maybe another corner or two. But I think that he's going to be someone who's going to be gone before pick 62 again. And uh, it might be a sleeper pick, Alec, that nobody's expecting at pick 30 if we do go corner. And we like him better than Kool-Aid because there's not a lot he can't do. I mean, he's fast. He's quick. I like his eye balance in zone. I mentioned earlier, he stuck out at the Senior Bowl, him and Gwynion Mitchell, as clearly the two best defensive backs there. Um, you just watch him play. He plays like a Raven. When I had James Ogden on, he noticed, noticed the same thing. Player I've talked quite a lot a bit, uh, about on this channel uh, in these kind of videos before. 5'11", 187, okay, maybe he's not an outside corner. He does have offensive line, like, length arms, which helps him at the catch point. He won't back down. Just a feisty, feisty player. And 5'11", 187, like I said to James, if my only knock on a player is I wish he was were two inches taller and 10 pounds heavier, then I kind of have to check myself and, be, and say, look, it's not all about the measurables. There will be a guy on the other team, Alec, that is a good route runner and is about the same size. And you're going to want someone like Max Melton who can travel and match up on that guy. And that's the kind of ceiling I think Melton has in this league is just an ultra athletic corner when it comes to quickness and long speed. One of my big concerns about Max at the 30 spot, it makes me wonder if he's even, you know, that high on the Ravens board is because of the off the field issues. I know that those uh, kind of are in his past at this point And, um, 
you know, could be, uh, you know, maybe something he's grown from, but definitely something to kind of keep an eye on. Um, and also his ability to draw penalties, I feel like because of his, uh, you know, lack of prototypical speed, um, or not not supposed to be speed, but the, his size, he can kind of get handsy and then, um, you know, result in a penalty. I, I guess those aren't big enough detractors for you. No, I think that some of his hand usage and his grabbiness is coachable. Um, I look back at like last year, Jacorian Bennett out of Maryland. He was a guy that I significantly dropped and he had a rough year with the Raiders. Um, of course, it is Las Vegas and a lot of times <laughs> players get lost out there uh, in the development. But, uh, you know, he was extremely grabby. Jacorian Bennett, uh, senior bowl grabby, like it was just his default grabbiness. Melton to me is just more aggressiveness overall. And um, I think that it's going to be more easily coached out of him than with a player that I say is like habitually grabby. I think Max Melton's more falls more onto the aggressive uh, path. And of course you can put him in zone. Like I said, his eye balance and zone and making plays on the ball from, um, from that spot are also very good. So he's versatile enough. You want to man him up. You want to put him in zone. You want to put him in the slot. You want to put him, you know, at left corner. You can you can do all that. Um, so we've we've seen a pretty good sample of Max Melton. He might even be big and strong if he added a little bit of strength. Might also be strong enough to press. So uh, just a corner that I I just love his game. And again, he's got that play like a Raven mentality, hair on fire. Um, he would fit into our defense and make a lot of plays. Awesome. Well, the next guy, also a riser, is Edgering Cooper, inside linebacker out of Texas A&M. Interested to hear your evaluation. He's pretty darn high on your board. Must be that great of a player. I just don't know what we would do with him. Yeah, exactly. And uh, <laughs> that's why he started out at number 50 on my board and worked his way up to number 41, mm -hmm. is that he started out at 50 because he's an inside linebacker. And I had him in that cluster that you can probably see on your screen right now with Junior Colson, with Peyton Wilson. And I, I had him right there at the front of that pack. But to me, he's better than those guys. And a lot of people have Peyton Wilson, number one, or Colson, number one. I am an Edger and Cooper fan. I always point people to the Alabama game. I think that cut ups on YouTube. Uh, if you want to go watch him play against Alabama and chase Jalen Mil Milrow, um, just an excellent player. I think that, you know, for him to be available at 62, maybe a stretch, he, he's probably one of those players that goes before then. And if he does fall to 62, there's probably a receiver or a cornerback or uh, an offensive tackle even, or a lineman that we would prefer before him. Mm -hmm. But man, Alec, he's a good player. And seeing what Patrick Queen and Roquan did last year, Cooper can blitz. He's got a bunch of sacks to his resume. It's just a complete linebacker to me. He could handle Mike if Roquan got hurt. Um, I just love him that much. I thought he deserved to be moved up in his rightful spot, even with it being a non-need. I wanted to give him his due and scoot him up ahead of some of the other guys at positions of need, but I don't think are quite the player that Adrian Cooper is. I mean, it makes sense to me. You know, you got to get um... – excited when you see such a long and athletic player he has that speed to catch up with people even when he doesn't have the angle um that said he can also run himself out of place you know he can over pursue um and i think like one of the big things that he'll benefit from is maybe you know and he'll, he probably won't get it as a redshirt year to just improve as a processor but sometimes you just need the game experience to do that too um reminds me a lot of uh you know the patrick queens of the world and 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 guys that you know have all the tools to be excellent and it might just take a little bit longer to reach their full potential, but that's, that's to be expected that position. So infrequent do inside linebackers just, and, and you know, in. unfortunately for him, he's probably going to be drafted to a team that asks him to start right away. Oh, like yeah. Patrick Queen <laughs> yep. And be the Mike like Patrick queen. But could you imagine if he got the break in next to Roquan and if he overruns one or two plays a game where Roquan and Kyle Hamilton and the guys are rallying and it doesn't make a difference and you still have that playmaking ability that a Patrick right. Queen had. Also, his coverage chops, I think, are really good. He won't struggle with the, all the action going on around him. Um, yeah, I, I love Edger and Cooper. Had to scoot him up nine spots just because I think he deserved it, and I had to kind of put the need in the in uh, away for a second and look at the fit and be like, man, there's a chance that if this board goes horribly wrong for the Ravens, and we don't like anybody there, and Cooper's still there, you could say, look, Cooper was by far the BPA. 
Nice. Well, the next guy, this one hurt my heart a little bit to see. Marshawn Lloyd out of USC running back. The first guy I think me and you talked about. You, you put him on my radar. You said, can you look at this guy? From 49 to 66, down 17, running back. I know why you did it. I get it. But it, it still hurts my heart a little bit, man. I feel betrayed. <laughs> it hurts my heart. You know, I I, uh, I remember asking you to. I'm like, wait a minute. What am I? What am I missing? Why do draft analysts not have him as the number one, number two, or even number three back on the list? And you know, he's still sitting there at uh, what my third running back overall. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. he's still my number two running back, as a matter of fact. So I love him, man. It's just one big issue, and it's a big issue. And that is the fumbling issues. You have the uh, the stats there, Alec. Yeah. So yeah, eight fumbles collegially, three in twenty twenty three. That's what everyone talks about. I actually have heard a couple of analysts say, you know, if you can fix this problem, which I do think is fixable. I think it's it's pretty fixable. He could be one of the top backs, and that's kind of where we both had him in our heads. We're like, all right, we're going to figure out this ball security problem. And he has some really great ability. Uh, his speed, cutback ability. He looks the part of what you want to see in a Ravens uh, running back. I just don't know. I don't think he'll last to the point where the Ravens could take that kind of luxury and pick him. That's my thought. I know they said they're going to pick a running back. I just feel like it would have to be later. Like, I just, I think he'd be gone and we would still have a corner on the board we want to draft or, you know, a wide receiver. And like, every time I'm going to choose that (laughs) personally. Right. So it's 66 on the board. He'd be somebody that I'd be looking at at third round at the earliest. So 66 seems high. We'd be like, what are you talking about? You pick at 93, but other teams are going to have him lower. They're going to have other running backs higher. So it's quite possible. I would say 50, 50, at least uh, that he's there at 93. Um, The fumbling issues are definitely going to scare off some teams. And I've, I mean, we've seen it over the, over the years. The most famous example, I think is Tiki Barber where he had huge fumbling issues, fixed it. I think he ran for 2,000 yards that one year. Um, so we have seen it in the league before. And he also you know, ran that mesh point with Caleb Williams. So a lot of long handoffs like the Ravens yeah. do, uh, the read option type stuff, maybe that contributed to it. Uh, the fumble versus Utah, I don't remember exactly what kind of fumble it was, but that was the one that I saw on tape. Uh, overall, though, Alec, you're talking about somebody who's really good out of the backfield. I liked his pass protection. I liked him on the scramble drill. Uh, he has that instinct to be, okay, I'm blocking, I'm blocking. Okay, this play is unfolding this kind of unforeseen way. Let me go ahead, leak out here, turn my head, give the quarterback a target, make a play, make a first down. Fast, strong. He's built like an NFL player. And um, I, I do think that one of the things that you mentioned to me and I've seen on Dane's reports and other reports is that they say he's bounce happy. That does happen from time to time, but I think most of the time he has success if he sees an edge and it's out of the play design for him to take it. So just a really good street ball player. And I think that that plays in to what the uh, Lamar strengths are and what the Ravens can do. And then one schedule, of course, a phenomenal runner, which is why he's up at the top of uh, many people's running back lists. Nice. Well, hey, man, let's talk about another positional favorite, Jane Hicks, rising up the board from 66 to 55. That's 11 spots. I remember you uh, you kind of gave me a little homework assignment with him, too. And I said to you, like, he plays with his hair on fire. Tackling isn't the best. He can get himself out of position. But, man, his recognition is so solid, and he could be a difference maker. I could see uh, how fluid he was tracking the ball, and I thought it would be a cheat code at strong safety with our uh, – you know, Kyle Hamilton and Marcus Williams, uh, you know, that trio could be epic. So uh, is that what you're doing too? You're, you're seeing that and you're like, I got to move them up my board. Well, we, we need a, we need a safety. And this is we one don't. of the guys that I would be thrilled if we got him even in the third round. Um, you know, I have him all the way up at 55 on my board, but let's face it. There are a lot of safeties in this draft. My positional favorites are going to be higher on my board than they are anywhere else. And uh, a lot of people, again, one of those guys that people come around to where I had them, I think I'm like the smartest man in the world because I got them <laughs> high. And then other people start moving them up. So I keep seeing them rise and it's for good reason. Uh, you know, you mentioned the tackling. You can knock his tackling, but what you can't knock is his effort in tackling and his aggressiveness. 
We saw him take on Braylon Allen, full speed, no hesitation, get the best of some of those. Saw him take on Dylan Johnson of Washington, another big, powerful back, full tilt, hair on fire, like you said. I think he gets a little over anxious uh, with the tackling sometimes and just wants to uh, put as big a hit and get there as fast yeah. as possible. But he's around the ball a lot. He's around the ball a lot. I can see him playing in the same on the same team with Kyle and any kind of any kind of throw to the boundary or the field side bunches, having him come in, bust those things up. And that's not to mention what he can do in coverage. Great eye balance, uh, can make plays on the ball. You can trust him in the deep half. You could probably put him at free safety for a handful of times a game, like the Ravens like to do. You mix it up, you know, show one look and mix it up and change to another. He could probably handle that too because he's a smart player. But uh, overall, he's your prototypical strong safety. You put him on that side. You let him match up with tight ends. You put him in deep zone. You let him control the running game, be an extra player in the box. When Kyle Hamilton's in the slot, player like Jaden Hicks at strong safety, you really have a strong defensive backfield. Marlon Humphrey, um, Marcus Williams on that side. Then you'll have Kyle in the slot, Hicks, and Brandon Stevens. I mean, wow, that's a that's a heck of a five that you can throw out there and really help slow down the passing game. So, and on, also, Alec, the Ravens need strong safeties too. So this isn't me. Uh, I'm putting him in his rightful place as a team that needs a good strong safety. Absolutely, we do need a strong safety. I think it's one of the most underrated needs in this draft. Probably the top underrated need. He played all over the field at Washington State. I think he would fit right in with the kind of defense we like to play. Totally understand why he's a starred player for you. Uh, and, and I kind of hope we get him, man. If we get on him in the third round, I'd be I'd be doing whiskey flips. You know, <laughs> I'd be excited as anything. All right, dude. Next up is Renardo Green, cornerback, Florida State. From 68 to 59. Uh, let me hear a little bit about why he got moved up. I'm just, look, I'm going to keep it real short because it seems like every episode we're talking about Renardo Green. He's just that good, Alec. That's all. I just, I just, he's inched up tier by tier. And um, one of the few corners that you can trust the man up. I think Edgar Allen just went on with him. He had said that uh, he saw a stat where he played more man coverage than any other corner in the draft. And that's makes sense to me from what I saw on tape. Watch his game against Malik Neighbors and LSU and watch him stick with Malik Neighbors. And you tell me what you see. This is a crowded cornerback group. Uh, he could go in the second. He could go in the fourth. I love him. 59 on my board. If we took him in the second round, there are going to be players that I have ahead of him uh, that, I, that I probably would take before uh, Renardo Green. But if we did take him in the second round, I would have a wry smile on my face because he's going to be able to help us now and in the future with Brandon Stevens being a free agent after this year. Marlon's, Marlon Humphrey's contract becoming more and more cumbersome. He might have to renegotiate that. Millette on the you know two year deal, which was essentially a one year deal. So yeah, cornerback a need, backup cornerback a huge need. Renardo Green would love to see him, and as Edgar Allen said, as long as he don't end up somewhere else close to us, that would be great. Like get him yeah. out of the division, get him in the NFC. What did you see, Alec? Did you like him as much as me, or uh, am I kind of on an island there? I get it, man. He's so smooth. He's able to stick uh, with those route runners and man, like you said. Um, I, I think like the big knocks is he's a little bit older. He's not the fastest guy in the world um, and lack of interceptions. You know, he's like just focuses on the receiver. He's really fo like stuck on that and just doesn't have ball skills. Like he doesn't really go for the ball much. I felt like, um, so those are the knocks. I'll say this though, like doing this project with you, like kind of looking at these rises and fallers and just like, as I've dipped more and more into the draft, what I've learned is a couple of things. A, I think we might be really excited with the players we get in the fourth round and even the fifth round. Like I can see how the kinds of players the Ravens want might slip. I also see that there's some really like exciting prospects dotted along the board such that it, like no matter what we do with the first pick, I feel like we can still meet those needs in the next four picks and, um, and get like good players. So I'm getting more excited about the you know, Ravens ability to kind of knock this draft out of the park. It just makes me want more picks because I'm starting to like more and more of these players. And, you know, as it, as it goes on, you know, <laughs> surely some of them are going to end up, like you said, in the AFC North and I'll be pissed and then hope I, that my evaluation is wrong. <laughs> so, so Alec, uh, just to stay on this for a second, because yeah. 
all right, we have two seventh round picks. Like the nine picks are great, but two of them are in the seventh. Like I would love to have, like you're like you're talking about extra mid round picks because the the need just to back you up the need and the positional value of these players and where they are and it just being a nice draft it matches up to the Ravens I think really nicely. Like okay, we need a tackle. There's plenty of tackles. We need a wide receiver. There's plenty of wide receivers. Man, we only have two safeties on the roster. Guess what? You could probably get a good one in round five or round six, like the good old Chuck Clark days, Anthony Levine, Deshaun Elliott type guys. They'll be there. So, like from start to finish, or at least start to the mid rounds, uh, round four or five, six. This this draft matches up really, really well. So, um, yeah, I think the Ravens have a chance to hit a home run, whether they're the players that we like or whether they're players that we don't like that the Ravens like. This could end up being a really good draft for the Ravens. The other thing I'll point out, too, that we didn't really talk about when we talked about Hicks and the safety position, there's so many safeties still in free agency. So I feel like a lot of teams are going to be trying to fill their this need in the draft. But at the same time, they might devalue where they take them because they have the backup plan of going with one of these free agents. So it wouldn't surprise me if you can get a guy like Hicks in the fourth round or the fifth round. Like, it shouldn't happen. He's too good of a player, but because of the need right now with the market, I could see it. I could see slips. So I think that's a, that's a guy I'm going to keep a close eye on. And, and just the safety class in general, like where are these guys going? Because you could just punt and sign a guy like, you know, for a couple million and call it good. For a year. That's right. They could, they could say, look, there's a bunch of safeties we like. Plus there's a bunch of safeties on the market. Let's skip safety right now. Let's go ahead and get this corner. And, uh, and and good players could fall again to the Ravens in that scenario. So, yeah, just once again, it just – I feel really excited about this draft. It also makes me feel really nervous. Like the Ravens have a good opportunity to help their team into the Lamar contract era to really build a good base here and add to the players that we have like Linderbaum, like Hamilton, like Zay Flowers, really good young players nailed the pick, and uh, we, could, we could have a few more in this, uh, in this draft. Well, let's talk about a couple of players that kind of excite me. Uh, starting off with Sam Rastill out of Michigan. You know, Michigan connection. Rose him up to 69 on your board. A very nice place to be. Tell me more about this guy. I fell in love with him. I heard he was a musician. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, you know, the Ravens signed Arthur Millette, and I yeah. started him off at number 79, moved him up to the magic number 69. And the reason is, much like Edron Cooper, He's just too good of a player. I just, I looked at, I looked at it and I was like, look, I know he's five, nine. I know he's going to be a slot only. I know that the Ravens already play Kyle Hamilton in the slot a good bit. Mm -hmm. I know that they have Arthur Millett on the roster. Mm -hmm. I know that if that doesn't work out, we still have our Darius Washington who started in the slot for us last year. Still have Pepe on. Look, we need outside corners. We only have Brandon Marlin and JAD. This guy can't play on the outside, but, Alec, watch him play. That's really all I would have to say to anybody who questions why I have him at 69. I think he, he'll go for go higher than that. I think he could be a second-round pick all day because of the ball skills, the toughness, the CEO of the team, as uh, one of his coaches called him. Uh, he has everything that you want. He's, he's just uh, vertically challenged, as many of us. <laughs> Indeed. He's also a little older at 24. Um, but, you know, the six INTs, two pick sixes, coach on the field play with Isaiah likely uh <laughs> I think it's one of those guys that I'll be excited goes you know before us because it opens up the opportunity for us to draft by another guy right um at the same time I just hope again he's not in the AFC you know just don't have to run into him too much because he does strike me as just you know he's he, he's giving the middle finger to his size right like he he's playing like a big guy uh he, he's gonna be a difference maker in the slot and, and frankly, you know, if he falls to the right value and the Ravens take him, look, we're not married to Millette. We're not married to Ardarius or Pepe. Like, Pepe is going to be gone, right? Like, you, you get this guy and Pepe is probably gone. Um, and he'll, he'll find his way on the field, you know. You never can have too many corners. Um, gives you a little bit of versatility as well. You know, your need for a, a, a safety decreases slightly. You could play Kyle back a little bit more if you wanted to. It's so, true. It, it's it's true. one of those things. <laughs> Yeah, he's a converted wide receiver too. Uh, not a lot of people talk about that, but it shows in his his ball skills and his his route recognition. Quite frankly, like 
he is one step ahead mentally of what's going on, and he's not slow. He ran a four four seven. So four four seven with with anticipation that adds up to tremendous field speed. And um, yeah, I mean he could definitely be one of your best five uh, out there in a base nickel package with college strong safety. So I had to move him up. I, like I said, I was biased against him at first because of the need for a slot corner is lower on our team, but in the end, talent won out. Uh, so I had to scoot him up the board ahead of some players that uh, I don't think are as good a prospects as he is. Let's talk about the guy who may be the most excited in this process. Roger Rosengarten out of Washington moved up from 83 to 63, 20 spots on your big board. What I saw was a basketball player with great mirroring, uh, super great at moving in the second level, just a lean, fast athlete. Uh, that's kind of his, his only negative, right? He lacks the mass for a huge anchor, um, could use a little bit of coaching to get a little bit more patient in his blocks. Um, but this guy, you know, oh, he's a right tackle. Well, he was blocking, uh, blocking for a left-handed quarterback. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a left tackle. I mean, they moved him, right, when, <laughs> when um, Penix got on the team. So I, I think it's one of those things pretty clear to me this guy is a left tackle he's sleeping he's falling down people's boards who thought you could get a left tackle with like the 10th graded tackle in this uh you know class this tackle class is just ludicrous man yeah it's ridiculous and you know he's listed as tackle number 13 on my board so i mean maybe i'm not even giving him as much respect as he deserves but i like i'm seeing him go in mock drafts in the fourth and fifth round and I, I don't see it. So with Roger Rosengarden, maybe there's a chance that I look idiotic and why are you having him this high on your board? And, you know, he does end up going in the fourth and fifth round, like people are projecting, but he killed the athletic testing too. Like his off season yeah. really helped him. One of the more athletic tackles in this draft. Uh, he just moves really well. Like you said, he was protecting Michael Penix's blind side. You can see uh, not a perfect pro prospect, uh, his anchor worries me a little bit. He is just quicker, faster. I mean, he's tall, so guys can get up under him. But uh, you're talking about being able to block in any scheme. That is him. Uh, very mobile. I think that the ceiling is sky high for Roger Rosengarten. And there's a chance with all these other tackles that we're talking about that he could be one of the ones that stand out and be like, why did he go? Why did this guy go before him? And why did these five guys go before him when Roger Rosengarten is – you know, like Pro Bowl upside, I think, with him. Uh, not a perfect prospect. There's a reason he's lower on other people's boards. Gets beat at the top of the rush sometimes. Uh, can overset, but it's not for lack of quickness. Uh, he's got it in spades. Really interested to see where he lands on draft night, Alec. Uh, you know, the experts are telling me fourth round, fifth round. You know, my gut is telling me he's like a third round guy. Maybe higher. Look, man, this is my thought. If we can get him as the second tackle we've drafted. I mean, we're, we're probably high five and, you know, across the room, right? Like this is, that, that would be a, a crazy pick uh, to acquire this guy as a second tackle. So now suddenly he doesn't have to be your left tackle. He can maybe be your right tackle, right? And, and then suddenly these cornerstone positions that are maybe locked and loaded, right? I, I, if we can get him in the fourth round, like sign me up, you know, 113, done. You know, <laughs> just we'll, we'll slot that one in now. We don't have to even see what else is on the board. I also liked with him uh, is he has heavy hands and he uses them. Mm -hmm. So like I could see him work inside and maybe the bull rushes and that kind of thing. His anchor isn't as worrisome. If you like condense the space and have him work in smaller spaces at guard. Uh, so maybe he'd be like the best left guard on the team. You can use his mobility to its advantage, have him pull in a lot and power runs, have him climb into the level two. And then with his big, strong, heavy hands, as I like to call him. Uh, maybe he can lock up some of them bigger defensive tackles, cut off that runway from speed rushers charging at him, and, and turn into a player that could be one of your best guards this year and then train him for tackle and break him in next year when you have a uh, bigger need at uh, left tackle possibly. Awesome, dude. Well, let's move on to another riser. This guy, I need a little bit of convincing, Jason. Why are you moving up Marshawn Nealon from Michigan? Yeah, you know, I, it's not a lot of tape out there on him, but uh, I did, was able to watch the Iowa games to see him against the big school. Uh, he's a smaller school guy from Western Michigan, but a big, big man game. He's 6'3", 267, 
So that should give you an idea compared to like most of the other edges are in the 240s, 250s. He's almost at 270. He's a hand in the dirt type of guy. And my main complaint with him is that his eyes get lost in the wash a lot. Uh, and that's a turnoff to me in the run game. Uh, Matabike has given me more confidence in that being able to be corrected. Uh, Matabike, when he came in, head ducker would get his eyes lost in the wash like Marshawn Nealon. Um, but he worked on that. And now he's a plus run defender and a $24 million player. Um, there's not a lot of development in his past, uh, in his past rush, but his hands are really strong, smooth mover, big time bull rush. Um, I think that he's got the school, the, the upside coming from a smaller school like West, Western Michigan, where you could really develop his rush plus run defender right now. And, uh, you know, if you could get him in the third round, I think that he is a rough, rugged. He uses the fact that he's only 6'3 to his advantage, getting up under and uprooting some of these lighter left tackles, play him on the strong side too. I think that he's got a lot of upside in his game. So that's, uh, I think, the uh, old saying, he'll make a better pro than he was a college player. I think that applies to Marshawn Nealon, but I can understand why you have him, have him lower. Yeah, it was just... I don't know, man. The the way the double teams can kind of erase him um, scared me a little bit. And just uh, the nagging injuries that he's had, <laughs> that's like kind of the last thing we need out of our edge group at this point. So I don't know. I, I, I guess we'll see where he lands. Um, not a guy that I saw enough of to feel super one way or the other. Just uh, just wasn't so sure, you know. Like I said, with, with Rosengard, I kind of saw it right away. Like the, the picture was clear. Uh, and then I was like, man, he has this guy at one one spot ahead. I should love him even more, you know? <laughs> right. wasn't quite there. <laughs> you know, another thing I think that he was victim of is something that I saw with Chop Robinson is Nealon was asked hand in the dirt all the time. Mm. And Chop Robinson, it just blew me away. But this dude runs a four four seven, the one of the most explosive first steps in the game. And what did Penn State do with him? Oh, let's put him in a four-point stance, head up over the tackle. It's like, why, why aren't you standing this guy up and giving him a runway to just challenge people to meet him to the spot? So with Nealon, he was a hand in the dirt. He's not nearly as quick as Chop Robinson. But I think that if you stand him up and give him a bigger runway, his bull rush is going to play even better. And he's going to be able to convert that speed to power even better, put a couple of tools in his bag, uh, you know, instead of him having him hit the tackle so quickly. Give him a little bit of a runway. And I think that uh, he's one of those players that, uh, better better pro than college player. I think that he's got the upside as well. So, yeah, I have him at 63 on the board. Uh, I'd be looking at him in the third round if he's still there. He would, he would be one of those guys that I'd be really happy with. 62 on my board. All right. Well, one guy that's no longer on your board, probably won't have to talk too much about him, is uh, Tavondre Sweat, defensive lineman out of Texas. Yes, uh, nose tackle. Okay, so that's number one. I had him 94 on my board even though – he was projected to go much earlier, second, third round, because we have Michael Pierce, we have Travis Jones, and we have other run stuffers on this team. Matt BK can stuff the run, but Broderick Washington, uh, we have Brent Urban. So not only do we have all five defensive linemen back, but we have run stuffers, and uh, Tavondre Sweat is a nose tackle. He is 366-pound man. The reason he's off the board, for those who missed it, uh, it's public information, so I don't mind just putting it out there real quick. A DUI uh, at, on a Sunday afternoon at 366 pounds. Um, so he drank a lot to be able to have his blood alcohol content up that far. So I just decided, look, we don't need another run stuff in nose tackle. Um, I don't care if the, you know, the guys projecting the experts have him in the second and third round. To me, he's not going to be a fit off field issue. So I just decided to remove him for the, from the board. I, I still think he probably gets drafted because he is an excellent nose tackle, nose tackle plus like a Travis Jones, where he will give you some push in the pocket, but uh, not the quite right fit for this team. No doubt. Curious who will take the gamble on him. Uh, weight control issues, class clown, party animal, gets a DUI in the middle of the day. I mean, that's, Right before the draft, that's that's rough, you know. That's yeah, and uh, Alec, it's funny because well, it's not funny, but he gets the DUI, and then all the other stuff comes out about him. Like people were hiding it, and 
and trying to, you know, just smooth it over and and not, you know, put a bad smear on his name before the draft, which is which is respect respectful, um, respectable. But yeah, after it happened, all these other the party animal stories and all this other stuff, you know, teams were asking him about it in the interviews. He's telling them that they're good, and then he has this incident. Um, so yeah, add that all up, man. I'm I'm kind of out. Understandable. Well, hey, let's talk about something you're in on. And it kind of surprised me because I don't know where he fits in on this team. A guy that many see as just a center, Zach Frazier out of West Virginia. Yeah, just what a player, man. Um, I'm looking at his measurables, and I, I don't know if he is a center only. And that's why I scooted him up. So initially I looked at him as a center only. Obviously, the Ravens have Tyler Lenderbaum, one of the best centers in the game. So although he was in the second round, maybe a sleeper for the first round, in the experts draft, I had him all the way down at number 95 because I'm like, look, we're, we're not drafting the starting center. That's a waste. But um, he's just a great player, and I think with his measurables, he could be a left guard. So that's why I scooted him up. Um, just to talk about the player overall, um, tough player. He came off an injury, a pretty pretty significant injury, and participated in the combine, which was like, you know, everybody was shocked that he was doing it. Um a wrestling background, not just any there wrestling background. There it yeah, is. Yeah, I man. You know it is. <laughs> you know it as a wrestler, man. 159 and two, Alec. That's a pretty good rest, uh, wrestling record. 4.0 GPA, four time state champ. So he comes in there at what, 14, 15 years old, wins the state championship. And in one of his years, the longest match was 51 seconds. So to wow. all my wrestling parents out there, former wrestlers out there, can you imagine your longest match in the entire year being 51 seconds? That's how good Zach Frazier is at controlling the person across from him. I mean, it's a body body control thing. It's a core strength thing. Zach Frazier has this. Now on tape, I do notice him struggling with bigger, stronger uh, pass rushers, just a size issue. But to me, I, I couldn't keep him all the way down at 95. Number one, He's going to go earlier than that for sure. Uh, a team that needs a center that he could sneak in and be a, like a shocker first round type pick. That's how good he is. But secondly, could he play guard on the Ravens and be a uh, top notch backup center if something happens to Linderbaum? I'm not going to rule that out. Again, I probably wouldn't take him in the first two rounds because of uh, the need and the question mark there. But I think that having him up at uh, 65 is more than fair. I think that he should be higher than that. If your team needs a center, he'll be higher than that on, the, on your board. That's totally reasonable. I knew that the wrestler thing would come out eventually. I know. I know about that. But uh, you know what else is funny? Married his high school sweetheart already. So you know he's not going to be clowning around. He's kind of just locked in, lunch pail, good work at that guy. So You would hope not so. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah, you, you would hope so, right? <laughs> All right, dude. Well, here's the last one. Uh, we got Kalen Carson out of Wake Forest, cornerback. What are you thinking? Why is he falling down your board? Yeah, he started at number 100 on the board and dropped pretty far down to 142, I believe he is right now. 143 uh, now. 143. Yeah. Thank you. So it had to do with injuries that I didn't know yeah. about when I watched the tape. Um, so – he had season ending injuries, I believe in 2021, 2022 missed extensive time, both of those years, and then missed the last game this year. So three years in a row uh, did not finish the season and he's a talented player, but this cornerback group is stacked in the middle. So that's, that's the reason the drop is so big. It's, it's not that he's any worse of a player. It's just that, okay, I have uh, Chris Carson in this corner. Who do I like better? Uh, they're about the same, but I like Carson. What about this corner and Carson? I still like Carson, this corner and Carson. Well, I still like Carson, but it's close. Will you factor in the injuries? Then it's I'm going to take those other guys over Chris Carson. So a local product, Maryland guy. Um, I hope that the injuries are behind him. And I have no idea what his medicals look like. But when you have two, when you miss two seasons or significant parts of two seasons with injuries that was a tiebreaker to me where i just pushed him down the board uh, a little bit further so hopefully he's good hopefully my concerns are overblown but it's a lot of competitive corners in this class alec yeah foot injuries are pesky hope the best for him obviously we'll see where his draft grade puts him uh probably be a good indication of his health 
So, Alec, you did a great job hosting this and studying up on all these players. Uh, I need to ask, though, what is your thoughts going into the draft? This is the last show on Huddle It Up Films before the draft. You are going to be away, unfortunately. I know. We need to hear. We need to hear from you, man. What's what's going on? Yeah, yeah. This this whole draft has not gone uh, according to plan in many regards. You know, I was hoping to do like you know twelve different shows with you, go through all these prospects. Uh, life had other plans, but I really was glad we were able to sit down and do this. And you know, as I've been dipping my toe more and more into these prospects, I just get excited about the possibilities and the uh, opportunity the Ravens have in front of them to have another historic draft. Um, I, you know, it. It, there won't be a Lamar Jackson in this draft, right? But you could see how this draft could be as impactful as 2018 was to shaping this franchise going forward. So I think they need to hit on these picks. There could be cornerstone players selected uh, deeper, you know, third, fourth, fifth round, uh, if you if you do it right and you get the right values. So I'm excited going forward. I just part of me is like, there's not enough picks, you know. <laughs> there's so many players I would like to get, so many holes to fill. And uh, just a question of where you do it. So I'm really curious to see when you have the board stacked, you know, when these early picks, when you have more options in front of you because less players have been picked, where do they go and how will they shape it and how will they, you know, try to navigate it the board? Personally, I still think tackle is a, a slam dunk if a, the right prospects are around. In the first round, I feel like you just can't pass it up. But I could see the temptation to do so if there's another Kyle Hamilton on the board and then you got, uh, you know, these later guys in the second and third and fourth round potentially there. I could see the temptation. I don't want them to do it. I'd rather them select two. <laughs> you know, I'd rather them select two tackles. Uh, get your corners. Get your wide receivers. No, no wide receivers talked about today. What a ridiculous class. There are so many ways that you could go. So many flavors of wide receiver to enjoy. And frankly, I think it's going to be like that for a long time coming. So I'm just not too, too worried about wide receiver. You know, there's only so many balls that could go around in this offense. Uh, we've got a lot of good players already. So to me, I kind of depress that need. would say take it a little bit later. There'll still be good players available. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll see how it goes, man. Curious so, what corner they go for. Because like, like you said, there's so many of them in the middle there. Pick your flavor. So if we traded Bateman uh, for a position player on draft day, would you think that we would need a wide receiver then? <sighs> yeah. Or would, I mean, it, I mean, would the priority go up, I mean? I mean, uh, of course the priority does go up. I think I, I'm just – I'm not sold yet this offense could, like, appreciate, you know? It's kind of like it's kind of like buying nice meat for somebody who wants to, their steak well done. You know, you're just like, uh, you know, maybe I can't appreciate it. Like, part of me is just like, will we actually use – this wide receiver to their full potential. Like, will we give them the, the touches? That That's what always kind of scares me. Just the way we run our offense. Like they're not going to get as many touches as they hope for. And I don't know. That's just where I'm at. What do you think? I don't know. I, you know, I, I've, I've talked before with Edgar Allen that uh, the wide receivers keep get pushed down that first round, man. And the, the tackles keep going in that first round. And, it wouldn't surprise me if the best player available smack in the face pick is a wide receiver in the first round. So not even the need, but it's just, okay, the best player is, you know, if we don't want to trade down, we got to take a wide receiver. But, and that's fine with Bateman uh, with one foot out the door. Well, what, what do you get for Bateman, though? Like Player. I would say a player. You think you get a player directly? Right. So maybe you get a, a veteran outside corner like a Ronald Darby or I don't know. Uh, yeah something like that or a veteran edge that could come in if that's what they're going to draft some point or I don't know. Yeah. I think it's a player for a player because a pick wise, it wouldn't make any sense. Like you're not getting much of a pick. Bateman for Ayuk done. <laughs> that was the trade. No one saw coming. No. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I guess we'll see. I know that the rumors have been swirling that he might get traded. I understand it. Um, I also could see him being like actually a big part of the offense and it's not a smoke screen. <laughs> like <laughs> right. talents there, you know, did so. you have a favorite player from this draft that stuck out of any of the players that you, uh, like did, did, did you love a player or not like a player that others love or pretty much did a, uh, I think it's pretty much good. I don't know, man. I, I think, uh, like I've said, I kind of haven't looked at every single player 
So it's hard to say like, you know, which one for sure. I, I, I have talked to you on the side though. Like Lad McConkie just looks like that dude to me. Like, I just don't, I don't get why people think he's just a gadget guy. I don't get the concerns. I think, you know, he, he could be a great wide receiver in this league. I, I, I get that he's probably not your, you know, prototypical X, you know, number one receiver or whatever that people have in their heads, but the offense has changed and the way that um, teams play has changed. And I think he's going to be an amazing uh, pass catcher and contributor to an offense. Great second fiddle or one B on a team. Um, yeah. So I, I like that guy a lot. And, uh, you know, Marshawn Lloyd, we, we've talked about Hicks, you know, it's kind of your star guys. I've looked at all your star guys and been like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> you know, like I yeah. see why you like them. Um, and like I said, you know, going through this exercise, I thought Rosen Garden is a guy I haven't heard too much about. I've heard a lot about a lot of tackles. Fisher is a guy I've heard a lot about. Morgan, other, you know, later round guys, so to speak, or, you know, further down the stacked board, but never heard about this guy. And then I watch him and I'm like, come on, you know, like another great tackle, add him to the list. So I think uh, there's just going to be a lot of, a lot of good guys. And that's what I'm most excited for this process is, all right, look at all the guys we draft. Look at all the people in the AFC North. That's something we like to do too. You know, <laughs> like let's see who else is in this division now. Uh, maybe look at a, cu- a few rivals and go from there. So yeah, we'll just, let's see how the, the board stacks out and where people pick players. Okay, Alex. So uh, you've watched the program before you've been on. Uh, would you like to tell the people about uh, our draft day plans here on Huddle It Up Films? And do you know the outro? Well, I do know that I have to say football is family. I know that for sure. But I do also know that uh, you'll be doing a draft show, and I'll be tuning in for sure. Uh, that's the way I'll be consuming the draft this year. Uh, what is it, 9 o'clock you said you're going on? Going to have some of my favorite people on. Love it. Can't wait to hear what you guys are doing. And uh, I think it's going to be a great show. Very big board focused. You'll hear about each of these prospects and what they're going to bring to their teams. And uh, yeah, I'm sad I couldn't be a part about it, this, uh, part of it this year, but hopefully in the future we can uh, do our thing together, you know? Absolutely. I hope everybody enjoys. I hope we get a lot of comments that we can bring up in the chat and give us ideas to talk about. So I'm counting on everybody to show up, show out and, uh, you know, just, Check back and forth. You can't stay the whole time. Check in ad free. So you're not going to have to sit through ads in the middle of the show or before the show. Uh, It's going to be totally free and um, can't wait. Awesome, Jason. Well, say goodbye to the people. Good night, people. Football's family.